All right, going live shortly. All right, you're live. Good morning from the Center for International Private Enterprise in Washington, D.C. You're tuned in to the series COVID-19 and Corruption. As a reminder, this will be recorded. And if you'd like to make comments, please do so in the chat function of the Facebook event page. And that includes questions as well as we get underway. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Andrew Wilson, the Executive Director of the Center for International Private Enterprise. Andrew? Thank you, Frank. And on behalf of the Center for International Private Enterprise, I would like to welcome you to the IMF and World Bank responses to COVID-19, the business case for accountability, a virtual event hosted from here in Washington, DC. This conference is the 11th in a series of public events on COVID-19 and corruption, which is being organized by our Anti-Corruption and Governance Center, headed up by Frank Brown. Today's event is one that we've been getting requests for since the earliest days of the pandemic. Partners in the field and colleagues here in Washington frequently ask, when are you going to have a session on how the IMF and World Bank need to hold countries accountable? So it's a lot of money, people say. Indeed it is. Many billions of dollars, more than 100 countries have requested emergency loans from the IMF alone. Some of these countries are highly corrupt and even in the best of times would have a hard time making sure that the money was spent for its original purpose and not to benefit a corrupt few. How the bank and IMF respond now and the kind of accountability measures they have in place will have an impact for years to come on the people, governments, and businesses of the world's most economically challenged countries. One dimension of the bank and IMF's COVID-19 related interventions, which has not received much public attention, is the impact upon the private sector, especially businesses in emerging markets. With that in mind, SITE put together today's event, and there's no one better situated to frame the issues than SITE's own Katya Lysiva. By way of introduction, Katya leads our anti-corruption work in Europe and Eurasia. She's an accomplished anti-corruption attorney with degrees from Georgetown University and Russia's Far Eastern Federal University. Katya has spent much of her career here at SIP and the World Bank with a focus on how to reduce corruption by companies. With that, I'm gonna turn the microphone over to you, Katya. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, thank you very much. So uh, this is a great opportunity for us today to speak about the business case for accountability. And I wanted to, in this very kind of short 10 minute presentation, to address three main aspects. Um, first, and it was really just to talk about the per perceptions of accountability that the global um, um, international uh, civil society organizations um, have and expressed in the recent months. And also then talk about some specific uh, views and concerns shared by the private sector in emerging markets. And SAP is very well positioned to collect those views and uh, is just a great platform to share it with, with our guests today and with all the audience uh, on Facebook. And finally, I would like to mention a couple of the suggestions, a couple of suggestions that were mentioned to us during our you know, numerous conversations with our partners on the ground. Um, with that next, uh, yeah, so our next slide. And I want to talk about the broader perceptions. So um, there are, again, as uh, Andrew mentioned, um, there is a, there, you know, there, there is a, a, a just IMF committed uh, a, a $1 trillion in lending capacity to the countries that are struggling right now. And over 24 billion have have already dis disbursed to over 69 countries. And we're talking about, uh, you know, countries receiving between 100 million to 5 billion or more dollars um, uh, in a single country. Uh, the World Bank and the IMF uh, in the recent years have um, made significant efforts in um, 
promoting accountability uh, and governance standards in their funded uh, uh, pro programs and projects. Uh, and one example of that is the IMF 2018 framework uh, for enhanced engagement and governance. Really the goal was, and we had a large presentation of that at SIPE last year with the authors of this uh, framework and systematically address corruption risks in, in the IFIs, international financial institutions uh, uh, programs. Uh, also, the IMF and the World Bank are committed to accountability, and it's evident from the public statements that have been made recently, just for example, by the managing director of the IMF, Kristalina Georgieva, who, who talked to Transparency International uh, in explaining how uh, accountability has been you know, strengthened or addressed in the current emergency funding. Uh, and there, that was in response partly to a letter that uh, some of the leading international NGOs uh, uh, sent to the executive board of the IMF uh, in early April, uh, you know, pointing to the urgent need for anti-corruption measures. And uh, we hope that today conversation will touch on some of the responses that both the IMF and the World Bank implemented as a result of these concerns. And with all the work that the international financial institutions have done in terms of, you know, communicating their commitment and building certain controls in, uh, in the financial mechanisms, there are, of course, uh, uh, the concerns remain. And the concerns primarily due to the nature of the crisis we're dealing with, where there is an urgent need for a, a, a enormous amount of funding. And when the IMF is using, uh, you know, pri uh, primarily some of to a um, uh, to mechanism which is called a uh, rapid financing instrument and rapid credit facility that allow for this uh, urgency, that allow for this flexibility. However, the concern uh, has been that there is a limited transparency and conditionality uh, involved with this. Um, another um, trend that we've observed in the recent months is that uh, the states respond to the crisis and trying to contain by introducing emergency measures. And we see that 80 state states have introduced emergency declarations, uh, about 35 states uh, limited freedom of expression to some extent, and in total 120 countries uh, restricted freedom of assembly. And this is based on the data provided by the International Center for Nonprofit Law. Uh, at the same time, from our perspective, the private sector, especially those small and medium-sized enterprises, are struggling as well. Uh, the survey that we conduct around the world show that over 18% of those small businesses are struggling to survive and stay in business. And another concern here is that those uh, achievements made in terms of business integrity and corruption compliance that uh, were um, that, that were accomplished in the recent years, now they're also being put uh, um, to test. So that's kind of the general background of what we're dealing with. And in the next slide, I would like to mention some specific uh, views that our private sector partners uh, share with us. And when I say uh, private sector partners, I'd like to, for the benefit of our audience, uh, to specify that we're talking about a network of over 600 business associations and chambers of commerce, economic think tanks and individual companies that SAIB has been engaged in over 50 countries around the world in the recent decade. And we also see that the private sector uh, has been taking, has, has really taken a role, active role uh, during the crisis. Uh, they're becoming a community uh, leadership, um, you know, they're playing this role of the leadership in the times of crisis. And we report on examples of when the, um, the private sector companies and uh, business uh, associations organize the nation of funds and uh, goods. They coordinate relief efforts. They advocate for essential uh, uh, supply lines remain open. They work with the governments. And there are numerous examples of that that we reported in the recent months. Again, this is all available in our blogs. Um, however, uh, our partners also voice some concerns. And because we as a SIP, we work with the private sector and uh, um, really enhance capacity of the private sector to play this active role uh, and advocate uh, for, for the rights uh, 
we see that uh, what they currently observe is that there is limited transparency in uh, funding priorities, and, and we're talking about emergency funding priorities and allocation. For example, uh, the private sector, especially smaller companies, see that the larger companies get support um, versus smaller companies that are left um, behind. Uh, there is also limited opportunities for civil society uh, oversight. Uh, and uh, these uh, two troubling trends lead to um, uh, quite negative consequences for the entire society to, to deal with the crisis, such as, you know, it feeds, it food feeds distrust in government's intentions and ability to address the crisis. And also it raises concerns over increased plutocracy. And my final slide, I will talk about some of the suggestions, some of the ideas that we hear from our private sector partners and what can be done to enhance the role of the private sector in this very important, as well being part of the civil society, of course, in their countries, to play this role of, uh, you know, of monitoring on overseeing the uh, emergency funding priority development and um, disbursement allocation. Uh, it was a it was, it was wonderful to see that Kristalina Christina Georgieva, again, the IMF managing director mentioned in her latest uh, interview with the Transparency International that IMF country teams are encouraged to engage with civil society organizations in the countries to seek their views on policy priorities and also uh, inform them about what the IMF uh, uh, efforts in these countries are. And suggestions that we have heard some two specific suggestions. One is that IFIs, international financial institutions such as the World Bank and uh, the IMF, can actually play this coordinating role in bringing to the table uh, both the private sector, uh, sorry, the private public sector uh, officials, but also the uh, civil society leaders in those countries uh, to ensure that there is enough uh, accountability again, during this you know, very challenging times. And the second idea that um, has been voiced, and I have to say that uh, it's been expressed um, by Frank Vogel in uh, several of his publications, uh, analysis of the current situation, accountability, is that uh, strengthen the role of independent uh, CSO civil society organizations in monitoring. Basically by almost including it as a, as a potentially as one of the conditions for, uh, um, for dispersing those funds. Uh, and there are two very specific questions that came to us as how the private, uh, private sector can be, uh, can be effective in their you know, advocacy and their monitoring uh, uh, role is just really better understand how the funding is happening. Uh, for example, where they can find information on procurement contracts or beneficial owners of those who get uh, those, uh, you know, the, those uh, funds. Uh, the results of the independent audits of crisis related spending. Uh, also, uh, we know that the IMF and uh, Kristalina Georgieva was also talking about it, has other mechanisms that are um, uh, that, that have existed before and that can be helpful in better understanding uh, you know, what, what, uh, how accountability can be strengthened. For example, there are special country safeguard assessment that the, uh, the IMF uh, is requiring from the countries, which is the basically central banks reporting and controls uh, reports. So the private sector and civil society can um, inform uh, themselves about those commitments to these documents. And there is another mechanism, which is the existing uh, multi-year financial uh, arrangements with the IMF that uh, focus on also long-term structural issues that can be also helpful for the private sector and civil society to get a better idea of what have been achieved, of what commitments the governments uh, uh, have made in the recent years and what progress they have made on those commitments. And finally, uh, if the private sector is part of the civil society, if they see something, where can they report it? Uh, basically, if there is a, a, a line where they can report some concerns, of course, with the whistleblower protection uh, um, uh, notion that without the fear of um, uh, retaliation.
And so with that, I would like to uh, finish my um, opening remarks. And um, I hope that uh, some, of, some of that, um, uh, some of those observations are helpful and they will um, be addressed during our discussion today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Katya, for a very concise and effective framing of the issues. Um, I wanted to remind folks that we'll allow up to an hour for questions and answers, which is often uh, for many folks, the high point of the event. And if you have questions for the speakers, um, please submit them via the, uh, the Facebook page. You'll find there's a comment section directly below the live stream feed. So just type your questions in there and we'll direct them to the speakers. Next up, I'd like to introduce uh, Rhoda Weeks Brown, who I had the pleasure of being on a panel with in Bali a couple of years ago, um, and know from that experience that we're in for a lively presentation and uh, some illuminating answers, I think, in the Q&A. By way of background, Rhoda Weeks Brown is general counsel and director of the IMF's legal department. She advises the IMF's executive board, management staff, and country membership on all legal aspects of the IMF's operations including its lending, regulatory, and advisory functions. Before joining the IMF, she worked in Skadden's Washington, D.C. office. Rhoda has a JD from the Harvard Law School and a BA in economics, summa cum laude, from Howard University. She is a member of the bar in New York, Massachusetts, and the District of Columbia, and a member of the Supreme Court Bar. Rhoda? I'm sorry, I realized I was on mute. Uh, good morning, thank you, Frank. Good morning to everyone here in the DC area and the US, good afternoon to those of you watching from, from afar. Uh, I hope everyone can hear me uh, to the organizers. Okay, I guess we're good. Um, I just wanna say thanks to Frank for the kind introduction. Thanks to SIPE for having us here today to participate in this uh, very important event. These issues regarding governance, anti-corruption, good governance, transparency. These are critical issues for the IMF. They're critical issues for us at the highest levels. Katia re referred a couple of times to our managing director, Kristalina Georgieva, and to some of the very strong statements she's made around these issues recently. So again, this is just a way of saying, I'm very happy to be here with you and to have this conversation on an issue that's very near and dear to our hearts. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing. I think Katia has done a very nice summary of that already, but then I also especially want to hear your views, hear your questions and engage in a dialogue with you. Um, turning to our COVID uh, response, clearly this pandemic is causing a tragic loss of life globally. It's disrupted our social and economic order on a scale that we've not seen in living memory. As we see it at the IMF, it is a crisis like no other. And in turn, I think it's fair to say the IMF has responded in a way like it never has before. So our response has been like no other. Um, we've done a number of reforms. Again, I won't go into all of those right now, but just changing many of our existing policies and procedures to enable us to respond more quickly and, more re and be more directly responsive to the unique needs of the crisis. Um, lending has certainly been a big part of that, and Katia mentioned that already. We do have a $1 trillion lending capacity, but that has not actually been disbursed in the crisis. But we have nonetheless disbursed quite, disbursed quite a significant amount. More than 100 countries have requested emergency financing from the IMF. We've already provided assistance, emergency assistance, to 72 countries, totaling over $25 billion. Um, and again, this has all been done in the last couple of months since this pandemic became the huge crisis that we know it has now become. And even though we've been moving at great speed, the IMF has consistently emphasized the importance of addressing governance and accountability. Our message to governments in this process of providing emergency assistance, our message has been very clear, which is in this time of crisis, please spend whatever is needed spend what you need to save lives and to save livelihoods, but, and this is the key part, spend wisely and definitely keep the receipts. We wanna make sure that transparency and accountability do not become additional victims of this COVID-19 pandemic. 
And so, as Katia alluded to, the IMF's um, emergency financing is different than our normal financing that many of you may be used to. Um, we're, it's not in the form of a multi-year arrangement. These are outright disbursements that we make to countries. They're given on the basis that there's an urgent balance of payments need in the country. It's not project financing, it's balance of payments and budget support. And so, as you can see, there will there it would be a there are some inevitable limitations on what we can do when we're providing this sort of one-off rapid financing. But despite those limitations, we have taken several steps to ensure, as I said earlier, that accountability, governance, and transparency are not victims and that the emergency financing is used effectively and not frittered away. So what, some of, what are some of these things that we've been doing? Again, I'll be very quick since I have limited time, but happy to go into more details. First of all, we've been focused on having commitments from countries that these resources will be reoriented to, or oriented towards healthcare and income support for the most needy house, for affected households and businesses. Is as I said earlier, focus on lives and livelihoods but also again, trying to ensure that the resources are used that way. We're in the midst of developing and implementing a policy tracker that would um, track increases in crisis related spending um, as a way to get a more concrete uh, information on, on, on those issues. But certainly that has been a key part of the commitments we've been focused on. Also the IMF has called for commitments for countries in the letters of intent that are specifically focused on governance and, and accountability issues. The letter of intent, as many of you know, is the letter that we get from governments requesting financing. So what are some of those commitments that we have had in the recent letters of intent related to um, emergency financing? Clearly these have to be very country specific, these commitments, but we've seen some recurring examples that I will now mention. And an important commitment that many countries have made in this context, and that we are, of course, will be following up on with the help of people like you on this call, but these are commitments around undertaking a credible and speedy audit of crisis-related spending and publishing those audit results in, um, on the government's website and more broadly, disseminating those results uh, more broadly. And again, you'll see this in a number of the letters of intent that have been um, written to us and that we've relied upon in providing this financing. We've also required or, or gotten in many cases um, commitments regarding publishing crisis related procurement contracts. These are most of these resources are being used for health spending, as I said at the top. And so what is the nature of these contracts and these mechanisms through which the funds are being used? So publishing crisis related procurement contracts and more broadly identifying the companies, the businesses to whom those contracts are being awarded, the beneficial owners of those businesses. We've also looked at the delivery of services and products to be provided under those contracts. And again, you'll see many of these in what we've done so far. Um, another set of commitments beyond audit contracting procurement issues also relates to commitments to specific fiscal and budgetary mechanisms to better track and keep an eye on the uses, both the, the, the receipts of resources and the expenditures. So things like treasury single accounts or the use of specific budget lines that are created to facilitate tracking and reporting of emergency expenditures. Um, another important feature is that emergency financing is subject to our safeguards assessment policy. This is a very, careful examination of the frameworks in place in central banks to manage external financing, including IMF disbursements. And that's a key uh, feature that all countries receiving this financing will be, will, will, be, uh, are, will be undergoing. And of course, it's important, really important to emphasize that this is not only about the emergency financing. This is also about uh, Many of these countries will be coming back to the IMF. Some already had programs, certainly many will as the crisis abates. And so we would expect that those traditional multi-year arrangements will be critical mechanisms for us to ensure that the longer term structural issues that need to be addressed are addressed and that, um, and that uh, this is not just an emergency response issue, but a much longer game in which the IMF 
is engaged. And maybe in that context, I'm going to also very quickly touch upon the broader context in which we're doing this COVID response that I just talked about. Because the IMF, as Katia already reminded you, adopted in 2018 a pretty strong and revamped policy for dealing with issues of governance and anti-corruption. Um, and that policy we've been vigorously implementing, as many of you are aware, over the last couple of years, it very much still remains in place. And we, even though we're focused on the crisis response right now, it's important to keep that in the background. So what is this new policy? We adopted this, it was, it was actually a reaction, I call it a new policy because it was so significantly different than what we were doing before, but it was really an update of a previous policy we had that we had just not been implementing as vigorously as we could and where we did a diagnostic and, and identified problems that we addressed with this new policy. So basically the policy ensures a more systematic, even-handed, candid, engagement with all of our membership, not just select members, with all of our membership on issues around governance and corruption. It focuses not just on anti-corruption, but it also focuses on very important, six important areas of key state functions in which governance vulnerabilities can be particularly critical and where it's important to get that right if you're going to address corruption. And so this broader focus recognizes the basic fact that I think all of you on this call know, which is that you cannot fight corruption simply by focusing on it as a crime. You have to focus on it as a broader issue and fix those governance vulnerabilities that give rise to opportunities for corruption in the first place. And so that's what this policy does. Focuses on the six areas. It's financial, uh, it's fiscal governance, central bank governance, uh, financial sector oversight, rule of law, a very critical issue, market regulation, uh, and also anti-money laundering. And rule of law focused in particular on issues around property rights, investor protection, and so, and so on. And so we have been implementing this policy. As I mentioned, a critical part of this is it's being done in our routine operations, all Article 4 consultations for IMF member countries for which these areas of vulnerabilities now have discussions of these issues. To date, you will see more than 30 staff reports with very in-depth discussion of these issues of governance and corruption. Of course, we've also have been addressing these in our traditional lending pro program to a number of countries. Um, and an important piece of this that I'll mention is also capacity development. The IMF has been providing extensive capacity development in these areas. Um, and a particularly important tool in our capacity development toolkit are what we call governance diagnostic reports. These are very comprehensive deep dive reports that we've done with 10 countries so far and we have another eight to 10 or so that we're, we're sort of engaging on right now in that area. But they're looking very country specific at a broad range of vulnerabilities and what needs to be done for countries to um, to make meaningful progress in this area. It's basically an assessment that then becomes a blueprint for countries to implement. Uh, a critical part of this is that we do it very closely with on-ground experts in all of these countries, um, not just CSOs, which are a critical audience and a critical uh, uh, community for us that we engage with very closely, but also the private sector. In all of the countries we've had these diagnostics, we've also engaged with on-ground uh, businesses and others uh, because you ultimately are the ones that have the sort of local knowledge that is critical if we're going to get these sort of diagnostics right. So I'm just going to conclude by, um, by saying that this is a long game um, and the IMF recognizes that we're, con we're committed to continuing in this area long after COVID is over. We will continue to do our part. We certainly realize that it's a joint effort to address governance and to and, and corrupt and anti-corruption. And so we will continue to rely upon collaboration with people like all of you on this call. Um, again, as I said earlier, you on the ground, you know the real situation. And for this to work, we have to do it in partnership with you. We're already doing that quite extensively. I'm sure we can do better and therefore we'll be very interested to any questions or comments you wish to make on this phone call. But again, I'll stop here. 
I just want to say thanks very much once again for having me be part of this discussion and look forward to, to the dialogue we'll have a bit later on. Thanks very much, Frank, over to you. Roberta, thank you very much. Um, and your comments have sparked lots of questions. Again, if you'd like to submit questions, please do so on the Facebook page in the comments section, which you'll find to the right of the, uh, of the feed. And with that, I'd like to turn to our last presenter before we get to the Q&A period. So Ed, we're very, very happy to have you here. I know that you're, you're quite busy um, for all kinds of understandable reasons. Uh, I've never met you in person, but, um, but it's a pleasure to have you with us. I'd like to give the viewers a little bit of background about you. So Ed is a Nigerian national who leads the World Bank's public sector and financial management team in the governance global practice. He joined the World Bank in 1998 and has held various positions in operations, including director of governance overseeing Africa, MENA, and the ECA regions. He was senior advisor in the Equitable Growth Finance and Institutions Practice Group and director of the core operational services department in the Africa region. Ed holds a Bachelor of Science, first class honors degree in accountancy from the University of Maiduguri and a master's degree in accounting with distinctions from the University of Lagos. He has a doctorate in management with a specialization in change management and public financial management from the University of Bath in the UK. And with that, I'll turn it over to Ed. Ed? Thank you, uh, Frank, for the kind uh, introduction. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. I'm glad to participate uh, in today's discussion, which is focusing on a most important topic. COVID-19, as we know, has put the focus of countries on the health sector, while at the same time wrecking great havoc on world economies. The shutdown resulting from the various containment measures has accentuated the economic crisis across the globe. Uh, the latest estimates suggest that the global economy is already in a recession with global GDP in 2020 projected to decline by about 4.9%. Consistent with the quick, creative and effective response that the pandemic calls for, over the past three months, the World Bank has mounted the fastest crisis response in its history. We are financing emergency operations in over 100 countries, home to 70% of the world's population, with the total support expected to be in the region of 160 billion. Uh, in preparing these projects, we have carefully assessed the risk of misuse of funds and put in place robust mitigation measures. Additionally, we are interested in all public resources being used properly and have also focused on that broader objective. Undoubtedly, the strains placed on the public sector in responding speedily to COVID-19 emergencies present a perfect situation for theft, waste, and misuse of scarce resources. Just to mention a few, opportunities for corruptions are present in all areas of government's response. In health emergency response, there could be corruption in the procurement of medical supplies and in salary payments to emergency workers. In support to households, cash transfers can be misappropriated. Prices of food procured can be inflated. In support to firms, specific sectors can be selected to favor some powerful people and resources can outrightly be diverted. In enforcing emergency powers, law enforcers can ask for and receive bribes. More generally, there could be an increase in the scale of corrupt practices that contribute to illicit financial flows, including the use of shell companies and other anonymous structures registered in tax havens to secure public contracts, loans, or subsidies. Policy responses to address these risks, such as beneficial ownership transfer, transparency that Rhoda mentioned, and enforcement of anti-money laundry uh, standards in the financial sector acquire even greater relevance 
in the context of COVID-19 response. Moreover, enhanced oversight measures in financial centers in advanced economies could help with accountability efforts internationally. It is noteworthy, however, that the World Bank has produced a note for clients on how to mitigate corruption risks in government's COVID-19 response uh, programs. Now, let me talk about specific World Bank procurement and other governance measures that are being utilized to ensure transparency and accountability in the emergency financing assistance that we are providing. It is important to note that the World Bank has not waived any of its fiduciary policies or diluted its fiduciary standards for COVID-19 response operations. It is also noteworthy, and this is very important for the private sector to understand, that the World Bank's anti-corruption guidelines bind the borrowing country and pretty much anyone who works for them as a contractor or subcontractor to cooperate with investigations in case of any integrity issues. Where deemed necessary, the bank is including governance and accountability actions plan in project design. That include measures to shorten feedback loops and identify and respond to any emerging integrity issues. While ex ante reviews may not be ideal for some activities, given the fast response required to tackle the health emergency created by the pandemic, there will be greater degree of ex post reviews. For example, the bank will post review all procurements related to medical equipment and supplies under COVID-19 operations. The bank is also expanding fiduciary supervision to enable electronic submission and more in-depth reviews of documentation remotely. Where traditional procurement procedures are made difficult, for example, things like face-to-face -face opening of bids, alternatives have been organized to ensure the integrity of the procurement process. And this includes, for example, the use of IT implementation support for procurement, which enables bank procurement staff to work more closely with government counterparts. Also the use of technology or approved third parties in lieu of normal uh, arrangements. Furthermore, as we prepare the next phase of COVID-19 response that focuses on preserving livelihoods and supporting the private sector, we are carefully assessing the risk of fraud and corruption in each type of operation and identifying effective mitigation measures. Supreme audit institutions, as we know, play a critical role in establishing public accountability. We have prepared a paper to advise them on how to operate during this pandemic and beyond. And we are also encouraging them to collaborate with civil society organizations and citizens to, so that they can be even more effective in discharging their responsibilities. Now I would like to turn to the issue of how the World Bank is responding to the global NGOs concern related to transparency and accountability in World Bank COVID-19 financial assistance, some of which uh, Katya uh, alluded to in her presentation. We are delighted that NGOs and citizens around the globe are focusing on the accountability and transparency uh, in the use of resources during this pandemic. And we welcome more of that. The most important thing to note, however, is that our fiduciary policies are gold standards and we have not waived or diluted them. At the same time, the urgency of the response has called for enhanced supervision, greater use of third party monitoring and other measures. Our system of investigations and sanctions remain in place. The same is true for the mechanisms for reporting fraud and corruption and other problems. For many of our clients, the emergency assistance that we provide is only a part of the overall emergency assistance, much of which is being financed directly by governments through taxation and borrowing. So 
it is important as we are doing to also give due attention to the overall government's efforts to control corruption and to the efforts of watchdog organization to ensure transparency and accountability for all public spending. Now, let me highlight some rules that civil society and private sector actors in recipient countries and globally can play in supporting World Bank's efforts to promote accountability in the use of emergency financial assistance during this pandemic. First and foremost, the World Bank expects the private sector to play by the rules and to demand the same from other firms as well as government officials. So we are all on a solid ground to tackle corruption. We know, for instance, that bribery involves at least two parties, the giver and the receiver of bribes. Secondly, both civil society organizations and the private sector can use their convening power and communication channels to demand transparency and accountability in the government response to COVID-19. And I'll be happy to elaborate on that in the question and answer session. It is important, however, that civil society organizations and the private sector do not focus only on scandals, but to also publicize cases of government officials acting with integrity. We have been encouraging our teams on the part of the World Bank to use civil society organizations directly to participate in monitoring the COVID-19 response uh, projects. For example, in a COVID-19 aid operation for Zambia, uh, which are, we are currently preparing, a governance and accountability action plan is being included that features enhanced transparency and accountability measures as well as grievance redress mechanism. To complement these measures, our teams in collaboration with the Zambia Health Teams and the Global Financial uh, Financing Facility are working on an initiative to allow selected civil society organizations like Transparency International Zambia, Partnership for Transparency Fund, PTF, and others to independently monitor the use of project funds. We are also encouraging Supreme Audit institutions to use participatory audits by involving civil society organizations and citizens in the audit of government spending on COVID-19. And they can do this in various ways, but I'll just highlight three of uh, the ways they can do, uh, they can involve uh, civil society organizations and citizens in their audits. They can conduct audits jointly with citizens and civil society organizations. Their audit plans can be developed based on complaints from citizens and civil society organizations they can accept requests or suggestions for audits from civil society and citizens, which may be based on broader concerns of the public. The involvement of civil society and citizens in participatory audits is not without risk. We all hear of fly by night civil society organizations which exist more for profits and to accrue benefits from donors. Also, there could be politically motivated interest groups. However, the overall benefit of participatory audit makes it attractive. And there are good examples of such collaboration between Supreme Audit Institution, citizens and civil society organizations in the Philippines, Korea, and India, for example. Finally, let me explain how civil society organizations and private sector actors can report directly to the World Bank any concerns related to lack of transparency and accountability in the use of COVID-19 financial assistance by national authorities. Anyone can report fraud and corruption to the World Bank through a variety of methods, including online and telephone. To get the information to do this, simply type World Bank INT online on the World Wide Web. The World Bank's Integrity Vice Presidency, INT, manages the systems and conducts investigations. It reports directly to the presidents and maintains confidentiality of those who report fraud and corruption. Complaints can be provided in any language. For complaints that are not about fraud and corruption per se, perhaps for complaints over procedures or transparency or some other problems that people feel may harm them, there is a grievance redress system. 
these complaints go directly to the World Bank for follow up with country authorities. I'll be happy to answer any specific questions, but I also want to mention that at the request of our shareholders, uh, the World Bank is currently developing an action plan on anti-corruption and we'll be coming uh, forward with that shortly. I will stop here and look forward to answering questions from our audience. Thank you. Frank, over to you. Thanks, Ed. Um, and again, your, your, your comments uh, sparked a, a flood of questions. So with that in mind, and given the fact that we have about uh, 45 minutes left for questions, I would ask our presenters, um, Katya, Ed, and Rosa, to uh, be quite short in your answers so we can try to get to everybody's uh, questions. So the first question is both for, for you, Ed, uh, and then for you, Rhoda, and it is um, a provocative one. So the questioner asks, does COVID-19 call for a reset of the ambitions on the sus sustainable development goals? How can governments transparently, transparently reconfigure their approaches to SDGs to have realistic revised targets, which would also keep risks of corruption to the minimum. I can I can read it again if you'd like. It's a it's a it's a big question. So I'll, I'll read it very quickly. Does COVID nineteen call for a reset of ambitions on sustainable development goals? How can governments transparently reconfigure their approaches to SDGs to have realistic revised targets? which would also keep risks of corruption to the minimum. Ed, do you want to try taking that first? And then, and then I'm sorry, we, Rhoda, if you want to take it first, and then Ed, will go to you, because Rhoda, I know you- That's okay, I'm happy with Ed. Going. Okay, <laughs> whatever you decide. <laughs> thanks, uh, Frank, okay. and uh, okay. thanks, uh, Rhoda. So I will be brief as you requested. Um, I, I, the estimates that are already coming through shows, for instance, that uh, a number of the targets will be affected. I mean, starting with, for instance, poverty, uh, given uh, the impact of uh, the pandemic on the economy, um, so many economies going into recession, we know that poverty rate is likely to increase, in, at least in the short term. So uh, then if you start looking ahead to 2030, you know that then uh, the numbers may need to be revised, both globally and in specific uh, uh, countries. Uh, so and then if you go to all the other uh, categories of the SDGs as well, given, for instance, that a lot of funding currently is being diverted towards addressing health emergency issues, and the fact that also resources of governments have been affected by the economic shutdown, and so on and so forth. So you can see great impact on the progress to achieve the SDGs in the short term, but uh, then that is also likely to affect even uh, the, in the longer term when we look at, uh, at 2030. So they, I think the real focus is then on how do you uh, revise the targets in a way that is transparent. And I will just say one important uh, point there, uh, which is that uh, uh, there are a number of stakeholders, okay, that are really very important for governments to consult with in this process. Uh, the civil society organizations, the private sector actors, and so on and so forth. At the World Bank, we promote what we call multi-stakeholders approach to, to policy formulation and implementation. And so in terms of revising the targets, uh, it's important that the various stakeholders are involved and that this is done transparently. Thank you. Rhoda? Yep, uh, thanks, Frank. Yeah, I mean, just to pick up on, on where Ed is, it's pretty, uh, what, on where Ed left off, it's pretty clear that this crisis is going to have devastating effects on many, if not all of the indicators that we look at in the, in the issues that we care about under the SDGs. We've been talking recently and some of the recent work that IMF has done, but looking at the impact, for example, on inequality, it's clear that, again, the, the effect of all of the, the, in, the economic impact of this is going to exacerbate inequality in multiple dimensions as when we're, when we're uh, past this crisis. Similarly, in the, in the issue of gender, women have been completely disproportionately affected and, um, and, and, that, and it continues, climate and any number of other areas. The way that our managing director has articulated it is we, 
looking at this crisis as a way to rethink how we've been doing policies and designing programs, not just on the IMF, but I mean, how governments have been approaching these issues with a view to building back better when we emerge outside of the crisis. What is that going to look like? How do we, how will we sort of come up with the kinds of new ways of looking at these issues that we'll need to, I think, come up with to address the deficit created by the crisis that has put all of these already difficult areas even, even worse off? I think that's the conversation that all of us need to be having right now. Not just international organizations, but of course countries themselves, organizations like yours, what does it mean to build back better in a way that has a more sort of comprehensive approach to dealing with some of these issues, using some of the negatives of the crisis to maybe you know, put in place new ways of addressing these issues, whether it's things around digital finance and fintech, whether it's the, a, a, a more focused approach on climate and some of these sort of green economy opportunities that may be out there. So I'm just saying, I won't, I'm not picking up, I'm not getting into details on how countries revise their targets, but I'm noting that this is a global and a broader set of issues that I think all of us as a community need to think of how we can use this crisis as an opportunity to, to come back stronger on these areas, which have definitely been very negatively affected. I'll leave it there, thank you. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, I'd like to give Katya a chance to to answer this as well, because it's something we've been talking about a tremendous amount at site is whether this crisis represents an opportunity to, to double down on the SDGs or whether that's just wishful thinking. This is a life and death global, global issue um, and it's really not a time for the SDGs to be prioritized. So I'd, I'd love to hear your take, Katya, because you're on the front lines. Uh, thank you, Frank, and thank you for a question. Uh, from the audience. So I just want to emphasize the word uh, in the question, uh, how can governments transparently reconfigure their approaches to uh, SDGs, right? So um, sustainable development goals to have real, a real, a realistic revised targets. So I think the question really uh, emphasizes that if we, there will be need for the adjustment and as uh, both Ed and Roda already addressed that there, there might be so it has to be done transparently. And I was very uh, glad to hear with Ed, Ed exa uh, had examples uh, of uh, those participatory, really multi-stakeholder approach in the World Bank's work, right? So where uh, there are even TI, you know, Zambia was involved in the independent monitoring and things like that. So I think if those uh, targets uh, for SDGs will be you know, reevaluated, reassessed, it has to be done together with the civil society and the private sector in order for this to be incredible, uh, in order to get the buy-in from the society. And as uh, I think Ad and both Rhoda mentioned that we can get out of this crisis only if there's a joint and coordinated efforts uh, from all parts of the society, including the public and private sector and the civil society organizations. So I just want to pick up on that word transparently. Transparency is the key, meaning that it has to be uh, involvement, engagement of all key stakeholders. So uh, moving forward, uh, whether that will be um, you know, a, 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 I mean, on the agenda, uh, the revised target for SDGs, the civil society and private sector should be part of the discussions. Thank you. Thanks, Katya. Next question um, for both Ed and Rhoda is uh, quite simple, straightforward. And if you could, if you could try to answer it quickly, that'd be great because we have the questions are really piling up. Um, so the question is, can both the IMF and the World Bank incorporate real time auditing as part of the conditions when giving out the loans? Okay, well, maybe maybe I can go first since Ed went first and you said a quick response, uh, Frank. I think the, the a quick response is that real-time audits really are a, a very important element. I would almost say a preferred instrument for, for doing audits in, in connection with something like emergency financing. It provides a very short feedback um, on reporting and transparency, the so feedback loop is a lot shorter. So that would be sort of a preferred way to do it. The reality is that not all countries have in place the ability to do the sort of real-time audits. And it's something that we've been at least working 
in looking at as something on which more technical assistance can be provided um, for some countries. Um, in any case, the idea of doing audits that are speedy and that are done as quickly as possible has been a big theme in the, the commitments that have been made for IMF emergency financing. So I'm saying, yes, real-time audits are, are important and a critical tool, but one needs to to recognize that they're not able to be implemented immediately by all of the countries we're dealing with. Thank you. Okay. Um, thanks, uh, Frank. Uh, I mean, just to complement what Rhoda just said, uh, I, I, I fully agree with her. I think it's, uh, it's preferred. Um, and uh, where, for instance, countries have the technology, uh, I mean, we do have some supreme audit institutions that have developed the technology, uh, and then you also have government transaction uh, fully computerized, then that real-time auditing uh, will work in those countries. But in other contexts, as Rhoda said, uh, it's likely to be challenging. Then we also have to note one thing. There are different categories of responses to uh, uh, COVID-19 that we are talking about. The emergency response, really one thing you don't want to do in the interest of saving lives, is that you don't want to put too many things uh, in the process of getting the response uh, uh, quickly, okay, which is very important to save lives. So then the question is then what do you do? Okay, there are other approaches also that could be that could complement uh, the auditing by government or auditor. That is the monitoring by citizens themselves and civil society organization and the private sector. So one thing we are doing from the one bank side is encouraging government to put information out real time okay on their spending and so on and so forth and that allows citizens civil society organization and the private sector to be able to ask uh, questions then with respect to the other category of responses like support to livelihood uh, support to firms that are now coming through uh, i think real-time auditing can be encouraged and uh, should be encouraged and should be part of it thank you and Katya, I think you wanted to add something as well, yeah. Well, this is, a, it's not, not necessarily about the audience. Um, so the, <laughs> this is a for preview of Ed and Rhoda. But the, um, I see that there was another question on the private sector, uh, specifically um, stepping up to support emergency efforts. And so just a very quick comment, I think, um, the fact that the private sector has been organized into business associations and chambers of commerce that actually allowed at the time when the crisis just started really for the private sector to um, mobilize very quickly and to provide that very important assistance in terms of delivery of foods and uh, you know uh, and uh, uh, and necessary services so I think that that uh, that is critical and um, um, and the, the private sector can go just beyond that, and it's, it's playing even better, even more immoral than just the delivery of goods and services, but also in terms of uh, advocating, in terms of monitoring as being a critical part of the civil society. Um, yeah, so that's just a quick comment to that. Okay, thanks very much, Katya. So a uh, question for, for Rhoda, um, and again, a but here it is. So how does the IMF ensure that its funding does not end up in the hands of companies from authoritarian states who may benefit from procurement? And how does it ensure that its funding isn't used to pay off loans from the authoritarian states? And that, that question as well, I think, reflects a concern we often hear in the democracy community in Washington, um, which is that the you know, the, the, the amount of funding flowing out from the IMF may sort of exacerbate existing issues regarding democracy, regarding uh, kleptocracy, corruption. Um, and that's, that's what I think this question is getting to. Do you want, Rhoda, do you want me to repeat it one more time? Um, no, no, I think I get the general gist of it, uh, Frank, okay. thank you. Um, okay. I mean, I think a lot of and the safeguards that I mentioned we're incorporating into our emergency financing would certainly go a long way in terms of making sure that the resources we're providing um, are being done not just transparently, but in a way where with the publication of things, not only of the contracts, but the, the requirements that countries make clear who the owners of these companies are, that there's in many cases, even validation of the actual 
terms of the contract and the goods and services and other things to be delivered. Um, all of this sort of this focus on contracting, I think, is meant to ensure that at least the process is clear, it's transparent, the basis on which these decisions are being made, and so on. As to going the next level, if that's what the, the question is suggesting, but I may have misunderstood it, but where even if all of these things are done, maybe there should be certain kinds of companies that are excluded or so on. That is not something that we've done in the, in the context of what I've described. But again, I do think the, the measures that we have been insisting upon in terms of procurement, in terms of contracting, in terms of being very transparent about ownership and delivery under the contracts. And of course, this broader audit issue we're talking about. I think all of those combined at least put in place a mechanism where it's gonna be, these things should be done above the board. And that's ultimately uh, what we've been focused on. Thank you, Rada. So we've got about 30 minutes left um, in our session. Uh, lots of questions still coming in. As a reminder, this is part of the Center for International Private Enterprises series on COVID-19 and corruption. And we're, we're very fortunate to have officials from the World Bank and the IMF speaking with us, as well as Katya Lisova, who at SIPE, um, and as a veteran of the World Bank's Vice Presidency for, for Integrity, um, is very well positioned to talk about the private sector concerns. So the next question goes to you, Ed, and it reads, as a professional accountant, what is your advice to chartered accountants, CPAs, and all other accountants in terms of bridging the gap between private sector practices and public sector during COVID-19, public sector meaning government practices during COVID-19? Okay. Uh, thanks, Frank. I'll be very brief. So just two sentences. First one is, uh, Mem I mean, they, those who are producing information in governments, uh, financial information, and they're managing the finances of governments, they are uh, accountants and they probably belong to the professional accounting group. So it's important that the professional accountancy organizations provide guidance to them for them to be more transparent, put out the information that the private sector or civil society organizations will need to be able to engage with the government. Then at the same time also, uh, it will be helpful if professional accounting bodies provide guidance to the private sector to help them to be able to better understand, access, use the information that uh, uh, the governments will be uh, providing. I think all of that will help ensure transparency and engagement on both sides. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, and this next question is for everybody. Um, it, touches on a subject that we devoted a live event to recently, which is uh, illicit financial flows and, and illegal trade globally um, in the context of the COVID-19 uh, crisis and the special concern regarding um, healthcare. So the question reads, what cross-border tracking and legal mechanisms are available to bring accountability on both governments and companies procurement of COVID-19 test kits and other medical supplies? which are procured in the name of emergencies, cutting corners and done on direct negotiation. So do we have a volunteer to, to take that question first? I can read it again if you'd like. Yes, please read the question again. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what cross-border tracking and legal mechanisms are available to bring accountability on both governments and companies during the procurement of COVID-19 test kits and other medical supplies, which are procured in the name of emergencies. So in other words, I think when normal procurement is suspended, um, that allows for a degree of freedom, which is necessary, of course, but it also allows for a degree of corruption. And so the question is what cross-border tracking and legal mechanisms are available to bring accountability on, on governments and companies in that context? Yeah. I I can start and then maybe uh, the other uh, panelists can complement. Uh, but I think we, we have to look at this from uh, two sides, okay? So within the country that is receiving the equipment uh, or medical supplies and so on and so forth, the fact that the emergency pro uh, procedure is in place does not mean that you completely suspend all controls. It just means that you probably replace ex ante control to ex post reviews, okay? So within the country itself, there will still be measures 
uh, in place to be able to post review all those kind of uh, 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 procurements. Uh, okay, so there will be controls remaining within the country. Uh, from the World Bank perspective, in terms of uh, the, uh, the supplies and uh, equipment that we are financing, we expect uh, uh, normal procurement procedures to be followed, uh, and we expect uh, post reviews to be able to take place. And it's not just post reviews by the World Bank, but you also have uh, oversight agencies in the various countries that are also responsible for post uh, reviews. So I will also expect that in countries where these goods have been exported from, they also have their own uh, procedures for uh, monitoring and tracking goods that are being exported and where they are going uh, uh, to. But let me turn over to uh, the other panelists uh, for their own uh, inputs. Yeah, from my side, I don't think there's much more to add. I mean, I think the key point is even if more, more sort of burdensome uh, procedures have been suspended, they shouldn't be replaced with nothing. And so in each country, the focus is on what are these, even if the emergency procedures that are being used, are they adequate? Um, and again, these, these commitments around the procurement, around the contracting, those are all ways of trying to, to not just ask the question, but to actually monitor what's being done. I think this recurring point about the critical role of of on ground participants, private sector, CSOs. Again, it's one thing for us to understand the mechanisms, to ask questions about them, to be relatively comfortable that it seems appropriate. But I think only those on the ground can do the sort of hands-on monitoring that you sometimes need. Um, but, but that's all I say. I, I, I guess the main point is there, there still needs to be something and that's, that's the, the approach that we take in, in making sure that we're comfortable with our lending. But Katia may have more to say, because in some ways, I think we're emphasizing the role. And that, for me, is, a, is an overarching thing. The IFIs can only do so much. Local, on-ground experts are critical to all of these endeavors. Exactly, exactly, yeah. Um, and so I would just add to this that um, as we emphasize and we talk to our partners uh, all around the world, is that, yes, this is challenging, critical crisis time, but there will be there will be the, the post procurement reviews, there will be audits, uh, internal and external, there will be investigation. So I think the idea that there will be accountability attached to that, the way we have, we have now and you know, part of the companies, the end what I think Rhoda, you mentioned that the, the governments will be continuing working with the IMFs coming back for additional systems. So there will be a point when this behavior will be assessed. And so it's very important to not just to realize your own role right now, the current time here and now, how you behave, but also understanding that there will be increased, uh, you know, um, attention to everything what was happening right now, and there will be consequences. Rather, uh, you know, if you are uh, even uh, acting within this under this crisis conditions, there will be accountability. And as Ed mentioned, INT Integrity Vice Presidency, you know, they will be acting on, you know, if there will, there will be consequences. So that's what we're saying. It's not just everyone will be, everything will be forgotten. So we uh, advise our companies to be very careful and to act with integrity and be those eyes on the ground and also understand all the consequences. And actually, this is what I wanted to just make one quick addition, just to pick up from what Katia was saying. Because I keep talking about commitments and maybe people are saying, well, commitments, who cares about commitments? But these commitments are critical because they're in writing. You can go on the IMF's website and see the letter of intent for any country that has received IMF financing. So that sort of ex post thing that Katia is talking about, we're not, you won't just be going to your authorities and saying, what are you doing? You will show the letter of intent and say, this is what you committed to do. And you know, so I'm just saying it's, it, it provides a very good commitment device for including for these future conversations to look exposed as what is as what is being done during the crisis. Thank you, Rod, and, and we'll stay with you with our next question, um, which reads, again, this is for you, Rhoda, to keep in line with what you previously mentioned, um, to consider the crisis as an opportunity, how is the IMF challenging member countries, especially the developing ones, to follow the path and take the COVID-19 as an historical window and opportunity 
to improve their social and economic policy making approach for the betterment of their citizens? Yeah, I think the short answer is we're in the process of having these conversations. It's, um, you know, the ability to, to use this opportunity is probably not the immediate sort of priority right now, given that so many countries are still sort of just dealing with the immediate impact of the crisis, trying to manage the number of cases, trying to have the protective, the medical supplies, the protective equipment, other things to manage it. So I don't think I can tell you now that this is what we're doing and these are the conversations we're having. In fact, outside of our emergency response right now, a lot of our routine Article 4 consultations, these are the annual discussions we have with countries, we've sort of put many of most of those on hold for the time being, because we're also focused on the crisis response. But I think where we are now is recognizing that this is an opportunity and we're looking at broader policy ideas and doing analytical work at the more general level but certainly all of that is going to translate into very country specific discussions when we get to that point. But I guess I'm trying to say we're still in the, we're a bit still in the sort of containment phase. At some point we'll move to stabilization and recovery. And I think those conversations will become much more robust at that point, but it will probably be building on a lot of the sort of analytical pieces we're beginning to look at even at this stage. I'll leave it there, thanks. Thank you very much. Rhoda. Next question for Ed. Um, again, on an issue that we often talk about here at SIPE and have featured on our podcast with whistleblowers uh, specifically. Um, actually, a World Bank, uh, or no, UN whistleblower. And that, that's coming up soon on our podcast, the three part series. Uh, I also wanted, before we get to the, Ed's question, to remind folks that if you would like to, um, and Caitlin, maybe you could put this slide up. But if you would like to subscribe to our Twitter feed, it's easy to do. And Caitlin will put the slide up, um, which is the last in the deck, I think. There we go. So you can see our Twitter handle there to, to sign up for our site Twitter feed. Um, if you'd like to go on our WhatsApp channel, we have a special COVID-19 and corruption WhatsApp channel. Just drop us a line at the email address you see there, acgc at site.org. Um, and you can also put your requests in the comment section of the Facebook uh, comment feed if, if that's more convenient. And now to get to the question for Ed, um, it is how is the World Bank ensuring that where whistleblower or corruption reporting tools are in place related to IFI lending, that citizens are aware of them and understand how they work? Are there creative examples of how this is being done? Okay. Uh, thanks, uh, Frank. So uh, I think there are two levels to this. There is the general information that uh, we provide through the website, through the various uh, documents uh, and publications that we pro produce, uh, providing information on how to be able to report uh, corruption to the World Bank. Because it's not just corruption about a specific uh, project in your community, but you can report corruption that you may be aware of on anything, and it can be by citizen, by uh, businesses, and so on and so forth. So that's more of the general uh, uh, information. But for specific projects also, we include in the package, uh, in some of the designs, how uh, uh, citizens can report, report on corruption, report on other things that may not even be corruption, but other transparency issues or anything they feel they have a grievance about. We have the grievance uh, re uh, redress a mechanism that is in place for every project uh, so that uh, uh, citizens can be able uh, uh, to report. I gave the example of uh, uh, the Zambia, uh, uh, I mean, the operation we are preparing in Zambia, uh, which is dealing with the health emergency that is going to involve uh, uh, monitoring by uh, PTF, by transparency, uh, Zambia. Uh, but as part of that, we uh, there is a, 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 an action plan uh, on governance that is being uh, developed. And that is going to make uh, information transparently available uh, on different aspects of the spending to uh, the citizens, but also let citizens know how they can be able to report on misuse of funds and so on and so forth. So it's not just civil society organizations being able to monitor alone, but there will be websites and other uh, uh, inform, uh, sources of information uh, for citizens to be able to monitor and report on the use of corruption. So that's one specific uh, project uh, example as well. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, uh, question next for Katya, and this is um, Katya will be answering, I suppose, on behalf of the IMF in some way. So um, brace yourselves for that. With not much time left, about 15 minutes. So if, if the presenters could um, could keep their quest answers uh, quick, we'll get to all the questions. So Katya, question for you. Um, how can the IMF support the private sector to monitor COVID-related expenses in countries where the CSO space is shrinking? And I know this is something you're witnessing firsthand in some of the countries where you work, like our Moldova and Armenia. So again, the question to Katya, how can the IMF support the private sector to, su to monitor COVID-related expenses in countries where the CSO space is shrinking? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, so <laughs> I don't want to answer for IMF, so I'll, I'll probably uh, then allow uh, Rhoda also to comment. But this is something that I um, try to emphasize in my uh, uh, opening remarks, because these are the, the questions that we get. Yeah, so we see that there is a shrinking civil society space, as I used the, the data to illustrate that. And it's harder because the, you know, the, the freedom of expressions and freedom from assembly uh, is being limited. So how would the private sector as part of civil society can ensure uh, the accountability and can perform this function of, of monitoring and oversight? So uh, as, as I hear from uh, our partners is really, they would like to have a better understanding, first of all, of how things are done, better understanding from the IMF point of view and those how the, this, the, the mechanisms of the, of the emergency uh, finance uh, funding is are working and what uh, commitments the governments are taking on uh, so that then uh, the private sector and civil society can actually monitor those commitments. So I think just better understanding of where they can, can find this information on the procurement contracts. Uh, so I think that would be helpful. And I'm sure there exists, right? It's just the even better uh, inf information on that, that front would help. And the second thing is um, uh, what we hear is how private sector can be, as part of civil society, can be better empowered to take on this oversight role as be part of, be part of this, uh, these conversations, right? So to understand that it's not just the accessory to some extent, but it's an important uh, stakeholder in this type of deals uh, because these are public funds. And so one of the partner actually uh, earlier this week mentioned to me, sometimes uh, it's been forgotten it's a public funds and some of these loans will have to be returned and the people will be paying, even though currently it, 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 it appears if it's just certain individual public officials are deciding on the uh, you know, allocation priorities without the proper in involvement of all stakeholders. So th therefore, these are kind of two specific suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Katya. Rhoda? Well, no, thanks, Katya. And I, th I think those were very good points. I think for me, I would separate maybe two things. One is the sort of emergency financing, crisis response, pandemic, you know, globally phase we're in now, sort of a more versus a more not steady state kind of phase, right? Certainly in the, in the regular, normal, steady state, the IMF in some ways has been seen as engaging almost only with the private sector. In the old days, we used to get criticized that missions would get to town and we'll only talk with the businesses and the companies and the banks and less so with CSOs. I think we've now clearly changed that balance and we do engage in most countries with CSOs. And, um, but I'm just saying the private sector for us has always been a key interlocutor group. Again, we've been increasing focus on small and medium-sized enterprises. I think that's been something that many again, mission teams have been very focused on and maybe can do better in some countries. But I'm saying for us, I think we've always seen the private sector as a natural um, interlocutor. And, you know, it may be for the, other than the last 10 plus years, CSOs join that space, but weren't always there. Now we see all of, you know, this whole group. COVID, I think, has complicated things, not in terms of the interlocutors, but just in terms of how we relate to each other, right? Because now, even for our, even for our engagement of the authorities, we're having virtual missions. We're having conversations like this by video. And so maybe part of this is whether, you know, we should be, as we continue to last longer and longer in this virtual stage we're in, 
if we need to look for some ways to replicate some of the practices we do in the physical world in this virtual world to get sort of more opportunities for engagement. Because I'm saying maybe I think the issue is more that sort of engagement rather than the issues that we've, you, we, we've been talking about are sort of core for us, these commitments where we, we having governments make, the sort of steps we'll be taking to follow up on those. Certainly multi-year arrangements are coming back. Again, some countries have already had arrangements approved recently and we would expect more of those as more countries stabilize and move to the next phase. So I'm not, I'm maybe I'm not, and I guess maybe the final thing I would say is we're totally open on this. If there are specific ideas and specific issues, this should not be the only conversation. Again, site is an organization we deal with on a regular basis. So maybe we can get a bit more granular, but you, you, the, the door is open. And I think maybe we may have some logistical issues with our virtual world we're in right now, but hopefully we can find a way to continue those conversations. I'll, I'll stop there, thank you. Super, thank you, Rhoda. So we have a 10 minutes left and I've got a sort of very specific question for you, Rhoda, um, regarding Egypt. So if you could, and sort of the mechanism used there recently, if you could answer that question quickly and then we'll have time for a general question for all three presenters uh, to round out the session. So um, the question is, as the IMF begins to move past emergency lending, for example, the recent SBA with Egypt, the approach seems to be to stabilize the economy without real reforms first, and then address the structural problems at a later date, which seems to me to be a missed opportunity. Is Egypt an exception? How does the IMF plan to balance the need to stabilize economies with the commitment to building better economies? So that, that's for you, Rhoda. And if you don't mind explaining what an SBA is at the very beginning. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, it's, it's first as an Egypt question, but maybe I'll address it as a more general question. The SBA is a standby arrangement. It's the IMF's most sort of regularly used a lending tool for non-low-income countries. So it's mostly our emerging markets. Uh, a few LICs also, but it's... Um, it's, the, it's not as concessional as our LIC tools that we have. But um, so yeah, it's, it's a multi-year arrangement that can be anywhere from one to three years in terms of the reform programs. But this question I think is a broader question that I'll tell you we're discussing in the IMF in some ways, even as we speak. Because again, we, the crisis has been completely devastating for all countries. And, um, and like I said, we've been focused on the sort of containment. As you move from containment to stabilization and you get to that stabilization phase, the question I think for both countries and for all of us is how much can countries do immediately when there's still sort of so many of the scars of the crisis that they're still sort of trying in that immediate term to address versus what they would do maybe not this year, but maybe next year. And I think it's an issue again we're discussing. I think it would need to be very country specific the Egypt SBA, again, may not have had, well, if you remember first, Egypt was a follow-on to a, an initial extended arrangement that we had that was a somewhat longer program. But even that SBA has a number of reforms, including on these issues of governance and corruption that are to be um, addressed during the period of the, SE, of the SBA. So things around you know, improving the budget process, um, shedding light on the financial operations of state-owned enterprises, um, improving competition, leveling the playing field for competition. There's issues around the customs law. So I'm saying a lot of these sort of very specific um, PFM type measures are even in that program. Uh, and those are things that certainly we'll be following up on. I also mentioned there's also very specific uh, requirements in under the SBA also regarding publishing the details of all crisis related spending. So again, picking up on some of these um, these points we were discussing earlier, uh, procurement plans and contracts that are being awarded, um, uh, looking at um, all of those kinds of things. So again, this is all in the letter of intent for Egypt, but I'm just trying to say there are a number of measures in that program, like there will be in many of our other programs. But I do think we need to recognize that this balance between, you know, just coming immediately out of a crisis and how much can countries do immediately will continue to be a broader issue we'll, we'll need to be to make sure we get the balance right on. Thank you. I don't know if that was responsive, uh, Frank, but thanks. That was perfect. Thank you. And thank you for being precise and concise. Um, we, about six minutes left. So if each participant could take two minutes each to answer this open-ended, somewhat optimistic question, 
that'd be great. We want to try to end on a on a up note, a somewhat you know, upbeat note with this presentation. So the question, Ed, I'll go to you first, if you don't mind. Um, the question is, how is what you are doing on anti-corruption during COVID-19 going to affect your longer term work on this issue or something like this? I'm sorry, so that, that's the question. How, how is what you are doing on anti-corruption during COVID-19 going to affect your longer term work on this issue? Ed? Thanks, uh, Frank. We, I mean, as a bank, we are always learning. Uh, and what we are currently doing now is uh, uh, very much informed by what we learned from previous emergency responses, like the responses to Ebola, to um, avian flu crisis, to uh, tsunami, and so on and so forth. Uh, as you will see in the forthcoming um, uh, World Bank uh, anti-corruption flagship report, uh, you see that we capture a lot of this learning, including some that we learn directly and also learning by our countries, things that we think will be good uh, examples. So, uh, so we are learning from this. That's important to note. Um, now, for other emergency that may occur in future, okay, we will use some of these lessons, okay, so that we are better prepared for that. Uh, for our routine operations as well, we are going to use what we are learning during this period for that, okay? Routine operations that are not emergencies as well. Then most importantly, uh, it's not just about what we do in our operations, but we actually play a lot of, uh, we place a lot of emphasis on what government does with their whole public spending. So what we are learning now from what we are doing is going to inform our policy advice and other technical assistance to uh, client countries in terms of improving uh, transparency and accountability arrangements. Thank you. Um, Katya? Uh, sure. Yeah, thank you so much for this. So uh, very quick three points. I think um, just for the, again, for the benefit of the audience, I would mention that at SIP, we are working uh, very actively on anti-corruption programs, business integrity, business ethics programs. We have such programs in over 30 countries around the world. And we haven't seen a decrease in the interest from the private sector on continuing this work. Even during the crisis, we continue our trainings. Uh, you know, I was surprised I was conducting a training in one of the country, 35 uh, representatives of the private sector showed up for the training on investigation policies. So, and it was in the first month of the pandemic when there was a lockdown order and things like that. So what I'm saying is that there is almost <laughs> an increased interest to these issues. And um, this is a good thing. Uh, as we speak uh, with the private sector about this very important question of anti-corruption compliance, business integrity, doing the right thing, report violations, train your staff on how to behave in accordance with the law in accordance with the business ethical standards. Now also they expect the same from the public sector, right? They expect the same from the international financial institutions. They apply the same standards to a level of transparency if we are training them to deal with their own financial documentation, right? So as we learn, as we're having these important conversations, they apply the same logic to all other stakeholders. And it's only growing this level of awareness um, and the demand for information, demand for transparency, for accountability. So we think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a prominent step we'll continue working in this direction. The second thing, uh, as one of the partners mentioned, there is almost uh, an opportunity as a result of this crisis to revise a social contract because it became uh, completely apparent that the, so the, the social contract that existed between the government and the civil society no longer works and the, and the crisis put enormous pressure on it. So there is this need to re revamp it, revise it, and the civil society is demanding to, to, to be part of these conversations. And another opportunity is, um, is really to engage with the international financial institutions for the private sector, what both Ed and what I was talking about, to be part of these conversations, to be part of the participatory, participatory uh, uh, audits, right? Uh, participatory assessment, all of this are extremely important questions. So uh, yeah, so I would just add here. Okay. 
Rhoda? Okay, thank you, Frank. Um, yeah, maybe I'll make three quick points. One first to remind that um, we are still very much um, implementing our broader sort of anti-corruption and governance framework, even in the midst of the crisis. I'll give you some examples. We're doing a lot of virtual capacity development, even as we speak, including that diagnostic report that I mentioned, which is something that we you know, provide to countries. We've been doing sort of virtual CDs with those countries um, that wanted us to continue having that dialogue. So even now we're doing all of this. I should have also mentioned that our board just last week, I believe, or maybe it was the week before, but did a review. First, that was a review of our COVID response. You know, what are we doing on the governance and anti-corruption in the COVID response? But after that, our board did a review of just how are we implementing our revamped governance and anti-corruption framework. And actually the paper from that board discussion, I don't know if it's already on our website, but it's gonna be on our website soon. So I'm trying to say that even though we're all focused on crisis response, we haven't taken our eye off the broader ball of our more general governance and anti-corruption work. And in fact, even our board remains fully engaged on that. The second question, the second point I'll make is that we will learn from this crisis. I think we're already learning, you know, I just mentioned virtual CD. Again, that may not be a substantive issue, but this is a way how we can engage perhaps even more effectively. I think we're learning maybe things around how we engage some of our audiences. Maybe we don't have to travel all the time. Maybe we can engage much more in real time. Um, and of course, we'll also learn lessons around things like procurement and audits and contracting and transparency in general, which is what we're focused on um, in this crisis. So we look forward to those lessons learned. It's too early now for us to list them. And then the third point I'll make is, I think our focus in this area is going to be much more expanded after the crisis because this crisis is going to have such a devastating effect on so many of our member countries that if ever there was a time for robust governance, anti-corruption, frameworks and reforms and mechanisms to make change is going to be now. Remember the IMF is in this game, not only because these are generally important issues, but because of the devastating macroeconomic effects they can have. You know, we had a report last year that showed a $1 trillion loss annually globally from, the, from, from corruption alone. So, you know, the number, we're not going to be, we could never afford, countries could never afford those kinds of losses, but they will be able to afford it even less post-COVID. So this will certainly be an even more important focus for us going forward. That would be my very strong expectation. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, Rhoda. I can't think of a better way to end this 90-minute uh, session than, than noting, as you did, Rhoda, that this is a long, long journey. Um, and in some ways, uh, the worst is, is yet to come. With that, I'd like to invite um, everyone to thank our presenters who gave their time and their knowledge and spoke candidly about an issue that, that's so, so important. I'd also like to encourage participants, if you have ideas for things that you think we should be covering with our COVID-19 and corruption series, feel free to reach out to us. You see our coordinates there, ways to reach us. I'd like to thank folks at site, Caitlin and Kai, who helped put together the presentation, folks at the IMF, Nico and Rose, who work with us there, Lara at the World Bank to help this come together. It took a couple of months, but we found a time and found exactly the right people for this presentation. Thanks to everybody. And we look forward to seeing you later in the month for our next installment of this series. Thanks, goodbye. <laughs>